So, oh my gosh, a block design can get really confusing, right? This is the other experiment done as a block design, okay? And here, what I'm saying is, remember this was the tomato plant experiment. You take a sample, let's say you have reason to believe that, for, you think that actually different soil is going to, the different fertilizer water treatments will work differently on different kinds of soil. So what I've done here first is I've blocked on soil type. So soil is a block. I've got soil X and soil Y. Maybe one's rocky, one's you know pebbly, I don't know. And then again, you run the entire experiment within each block. So here you actually, oh my gosh, have a bunch of different groups, right? One key thing I want to just highlight here is how does randomness work in a block design experiment? These, we know, are done randomly. How do you assign treatments? You do that randomly. Okay, this line right here, however, is not done randomly. How do you decide which goes in which block? Well, that all depends on which ones you have in your sample, right? Once you have your sample, I don't know, let's say, just to make things simple, let's say uh, uh, 60 here, okay? How, how would you decide which of the 60 go in X and which is Y? It's not done randomly, right? It's the ones that are soil X go in X and the ones that are soil Y go in Y. This arrow, right, these purple arrows are not random. These teal arrows, arrows would be random. Now, in practice, what you often end up doing is because wouldn't it be nice if you had 30, excuse me, 30 in X and 30 in Y? Well, if you just did a simple random sample, you couldn't guarantee that you would have within your sample of size 60, 30 X's and 30 Y's. So often what you do when you do a block design is your sample is no, not an SRS, but it's actually a stratified sample where you can guarantee that you'll have N equals 30 X's and 30 Y's. And so very often a stratified sample goes hand in hand with the block design, but again that's what happens before, excuse me, before your, uh, your sample action, you run the whole experiment. That's how you, that's a sampling design, not a question of an experimental design. The experimental design of a block design goes hand in hand with the sampling design of a stratified sample. Okay, so here we, very quickly, we talked about this before, but why would you block? You block if you have reasons to believe that the treatments will affect the blocks differently. We just talked, we talked about it a little bit before, I just wanted to make sure you have that written down. Uh, how large should each group be? That's an important idea. Well, the idea is you want each group to be as large as possible. That's the idea of replication, right? Um, replication, you want to make, if each group's really, really large, then the idea of random variation, the groups, the fact that groups are likely to be similar, is greatly, greatly reduced. Of course, what's the disadvantage of having really, really large groups? Well, it's harder to run the experiment. It's logistically more difficult. You've got to ask more people. It takes more time. It takes more money. You have to take more measurements. So we'll talk a little bit in the second semester about kind of how to pick your group size. But for right now, the big idea is how large should a group be, just as large as you can realistically make it given the time, money, you know, logistical restraints of your experiment. Okay, this is kind of a sentence in the book that I think makes a lot of sense. And it kind of leads up to the key idea. You control what you can. Um, that's the idea of control. You block what you cannot and then you use randomization to kind of control the rest. If you kind of think about this sentence as a way of, you know, kind of the idea of experimental design that kind of sums up what we've been doing the last little bit. You can tr there, there's going to be random variables. So there, sorry, there's going to be lurking variables. You control them any way you can. If you can't control them, you can actually do a block design if you think that actually the treatments are going to respond differently. And then as far as anything else, you just randomize, and that should kind of even out the uh, lurking variables between all the groups. Okay, the next vocabulary word is something called a blind experiment. And I think this is, I'm going to talk about a blind experiment and a double blind experiment. Blind does not mean the people in the experiment can't see. What it really means is that the uh, subject, or the, ex the ex sorry, the experimental units, you know, this is hard to write here, experimental units don't know what treatment they get. So, for example, in the case of my mosquito repellent one, maybe you, have, you, you don't label the spray bottles, right? Or even if it's a control group, you just kind of spray water on them so they actually don't know whether they have actual mosquito repellent or kind of some water, even that does, has no active ingredient. 
in medicine, this is actually really easy. You just kind of give people a pill. The pill's unlabeled. You actually, they don't know what medicine's in the pill. In fact, it could just be a placebo. It could be a sugar pill. A double-blind experiment is the idea that the experimental units don't know, but also the measurers don't know. Don't know. So that's the idea of, let's say there's somebody's job it is to count the mosquito bites. They actually don't, shouldn't know. If you do a double-blind experiment, they won't know whether the person has re mosquito repellent or not. In the case of medicine, let's say you have somebody, some doctor who's going to assess a situation on some patient. The patient wouldn't need to know what medicine they had. That's because it's blind. But the doctor doesn't really need to know either. That's what makes it double blind. They've done lots of studies where um, doctors will respond subconsciously different if they know that the patient has received medicine or not. Almost all medical studies really, really want to do double blind. And we'll talk about that a lot more in class. But double blind basically means uh, blind means the experimental units don't know the subjects. Double blind means whoever is kind of measuring it. You know. That doesn't mean nobody knows, right? Presumably you'd have some kind of third party that would have the records written down in some you know, book or some computer or something. So it doesn't just mean no one in the world knows. It just means the person actually doing the kind of measuring the experiment. It's not necessarily no. Okay, so we talked about bias a little bit in section 5.1. And at the time I wrote the sampling design systematically favors certain outcomes. Well, I want to just change this a little bit. It could be sampling design, but it could also be experimental design. And, for example, the reason we do double-blind is that actually if the doctors are talking to people and they know whether they have medicine, that could be a form of bias. There are lots of cases where bias can creep into an experimental design also. So this term bias can have to do with sampling designs, but it sure has a lot to do with experimental designs, and we'll talk a lot about that in class also. Okay? One example of a kind of bias is something called lack of realism. Okay? And lack of realism is the idea that people respond differently if they know that they actually are in an experiment. You know, if I actually, and you've actually seen this in your daily life, where someone comes into a class to kind of, you know, see how the class is going, and just the presence of a researcher in there, because the students know they're being watched, suddenly the class takes on a very different tone, okay? This actually comes up a lot in, like, food things, where you ask people what food they like best. Well, it turns out, like, if you give people a little Dixie cup of soda... You say, which one do you like better? They'll actually pick a different one there than if they're drinking soda, you know, a can of soda every day for a month. Uh, you have to be really careful when you run an experiment that actually the realism of the experiment, that it actually reflects actually realistically what you want to affect. And that's a really hard thing to do sometimes. People sometimes behave differently if they know that what they're doing is part of an experiment. So lack of realism is a kind of bias, okay? That is a very common one that comes up um, where certain experimental designs are not done carefully. And lastly, here's the last thing we have to talk about. It's something called a matched pairs design. And a matched pairs design is a special kind of block design. That's why I wrote, called it 2A. Uh, it's a special kind of block design in which each experimental unit is a single block. So the easiest example of this is, like, there's a imagine some shampoo where you want to test out which shampoo is it better, A or B. Well, you could give shampoo A to 100 people and shampoo B to 200 people, but random variation might happen, and maybe that all the people in group number one have a certain hair type, they're all blonde, and maybe your shampoo works better, you know, something like that. So very often, a, and a match pairs design exploits the fact that the experimental unit that is most like you is, in fact, you. So in the case of the shampoo one, what you might do is you might say each unit is one block. The person who is, has hair most like you is you. So you might, for example, put half the shampoo on one side of your, on the right side of your head, and the left side of your head, you use the other shampoo, and then you can compare the difference within you as a person. Okay? This happens a lot where you have people, for example, you want to compare like which type of shoe sole wears out more quickly. You could give 100 people one shoe and 100 people another kind of shoe, or you know, 10 and 10, however big your sample size is. The problem with that is maybe the people you give this first shoe to all go hiking and the other people don't. Well, you know who has a right foot very much like you? Your left foot. So you actually might give people one right shoe and one left, right shoe of type A, a left shoe of type B, let you walk around for a while and then compare the difference. Right? Or, for example, bike tires. You might give 
you know, 10 people, a new tire in front and an old tire in back, and then kind of vice versa for the other people. And you can compare the difference within that. Usually for a uh, match pairs design, each block has one subject or one experimental unit. Very often it's like left, right, front, back, something like this. And you use mat and then within a match pairs design, you compare the difference within each person. In general, you know, you could do the shoe experiment or the bike experiment as a uh, randomized comparative experiment, but I think we agree that match pairs actually is kind of better because it really, really does a good job of reducing random variation. So be on the lookout for that. And if you kind of recognized, hey, I could do match pairs in this experiment, try to do that. <laughs>